Um, I'm Barry Schreier. I'm the director of the University Counseling Service, and I'm going to serve as the moderator of today's panel. We are pleased to have this opportunity with you to gather today, um, and we miss all of you on campus and really can't wait to see you again um, in whatever role you have on our campus. This panel is being produced uh, to assist you during your time away from campus, to remind you of the campus resources here to serve you, as well as to provide you access to campus experts who will be our panel today, and to hear from them regarding tips and strategies during this time of COVID and quarantine to help you as you manage uh, and continue to manage and cope. One more note before I get into some instructions for us all today, I just wanna remind all of us we are Hawkeyes, no matter where we are in the world, and remember that we are stronger together in this community of care. And lastly, we are highly aware of the impact of COVID and quarantine and how it's hitting all of us differently. And our panelists will address this during their time with you. And I too want to acknowledge upfront that this impact is not one size fits all, nor is our capacity to manage it. So a few things before we get started. First, I would strongly advise every attendee right now to click on speaker view instead of gallery view, which is located in the top right of the screen where your image appears and leave this view on for the entirety of our gathering today. If you do this, this will allow each panelist speaking to take full view on your screen while they are speaking, rather than looking at everybody's different boxes. As it is possible to look through and see who is attending, we also advise you to, right now, turn off your video uh, to provide yourself additional privacy. This is in the bottom left of your full computer screen. While it is not entirely private, this does provide more privacy, we thought, than actually would be attending this gathering if it was at the IMU, where everyone would still be able to see you. Um, so it does give you that level of privacy. I also want to let folks know that we've taken several steps uh, to protect you and this gathering. As you know, everyone had to use Hawk ID to enter this gathering. You are also all muted, and you will not be able to unmute yourself, again, to do this to prevent any sorts of interruptions that we could experience. After we get started at five after, we will enable the waiting room function to add one more step for screening those who may come in late, which is sometimes when uh, Zoom bombing happens. So if you need to uh, enter late, um, we will be checking the waiting room. Or if your connection breaks and you need to come in, simply hold out in the waiting room and we will be watching and admitting folks one at a time. If we need to pause this entire gathering due to uh, Zoom bombing, we will immediately mute the entire gathering the offending person or persons will be removed and then the gathering will resume. So if everything freezes and goes to mute, wait and we will eventually resume the meeting. And most importantly, please keep community of care standards in your mind and attend this gathering with the idea that you are here for yourself. And so please allow others to be this way in this gathering as well. Let's talk real quick about chat and questions and answers. If you desire to submit a question, please do so by writing it into the chat along the right side of your screen. You may need to click on the bottom of your screen to enable the word chat. We will have a Q&A in the final 20 minutes of our time together. Please keep the following guides in mind when adding your question to chat. Chat will only be seen by the gather, uh, during the gathering by myself as the moderator. No one else attending will be able to see it in addition to myself or the panel. I will collect your questions and will either draw themes to post back to our panelists or if there are not, is there not a theme to your question, I will pose you a unique question directly. You can pose questions generally to the whole panel or to a specific panelist. If your question is to a specific panelist, please be sure to name them by name or by the campus service they will, are representing so I know who to direct your question to and all panelists will introduce themselves in just a minute. If we do not get to your question before the end of our time, Questions will be forwarded to the panelists after today, and your question and their response will be posted to the Mental Health Panel Discussion website um, no later than the end of the day, Monday. And we will post this web address at the end of our gathering today in chat. Any resources shared by the panelists will be entered into the chat at the end of the meeting, which will then be turned on for your viewing at the final uh, few minutes of our gathering so that you can see these resources. I will also post the website address for our gathering today. Lastly, this gathering will be recorded and captioned for later viewing. So those are our rules to get us started. So our panelists will now briefly introduce themselves and they will each take a turn sharing their experience, expertise with you. And we will also have 20 minutes again at the end for Q&A, but please feel free to submit your questions at any time during our gathering. So I will now turn this over to Kelly um, and they know the order to go in and I will have each panelist do a brief introduction of themselves, the service they are representing, and then I will turn this back over to Kelly, who will get us started with our panel today. 
Wonderful, thanks Barry. Um, hi everyone, my name is Kelly Clower. I am trained as a psychologist um, and work at the University Counseling Service as the Assistant Director for Outreach. Uh, University Counseling Service provides uh, psychotherapy as well as psychoeducational programming to all UI students. Thank you, Kelly. Noelle. Hi, I'm Noelle Mills. Pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I'm a fourth year graduating senior um, studying environmental policy and planning, and I have one week left of being your student body president, um, and it's an honor to be here. Great. Thank you so much. Linda. Sorry. Hi, my name is Linda Stewart Crone, and I work here on campus serving as the director at the RAC, the Women's Resource and Action Center. You can see our building behind me. Our mission is to promote promote and advance greater equity for individuals and communities of all identities. We do that through a variety of programs and also through direct services to individuals, including mental health counseling and advocacy for folks experiencing discrimination, harassment, or violence. Great. Thank you, Linda. Adam. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Adam Robinson. I use the pronouns he, him, and his. Uh, I serve as the executive director at the Rape Victim and Advocacy Program. Uh, at RVAP, we provide free confidential support to anyone that's been impacted by sexual violence and work collaboratively with many campus and community partners to promote social change and create a world free from sexual violence. Thank you, Adam. Janice. Hello, everyone. I'm Janice Knott. I am one of the medical doctors at Student Health. I specialized in mental health, so I'm one of the psychiatrists here. And we take care of students' physical and emotional well-being. Thank you so much, Janice. Karen. Hi, my name is Karen Graycheck. I'm a behavioral health consultant through Student Wellness. And in Student Wellness, we offer individual consultations and outreach programs on a variety of health topics, including alcohol or drugs, stress management, fitness, nutrition, and more. Thanks, Karen. And finally, Nikki. Hi, my name is Nikki Hodes. Um, I work in the Dean of Students Office with Student Care and Assistance. Uh, we provide support to students whenever there's a crisis, emergency situation, or really just that barrier in your experience uh, that's impacting you to try to help identify resources and options uh, to navigate through it. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you for introductions, panelists. Um, I've asked each panelist to take up to seven minutes each so that we um, hear from each of them and then leaving time at the end for questions and answers. Again, you can enable chat um, and enter your questions either generally to the panel or specifically to a panelist. Please note either the name of the panelist or the service that they are representing so I know that. Um, and you can start doing that now and then I will draw themes or offer these specific questions to the panelists in our final 20 minutes. If you enter something in the chat and it does not appear in your chat box, it's because chat is only enabled to be seen by myself as moderator and the panelists. But we will receive your information if you enter it into chat. Okay, with all that said, I will quiet myself down now and turn this over to our expert panel. And Kelly, if you will get us started. Yes, happy to. Um, all right, so um, it was decided that I'd go ahead and start us off so that I could kind of set the stage for why we're focusing on mental health. Um, so my time will uh, be looking at some symptoms, signs and reactions that you all might be having during this time, and then also laying out some key strategies that you could try um, in order to take care of yourself, and then I'll leave you with a few resources. Um, so this is an unprecedented time, and the COVID-19 pandemic is impacting all of us. The impact may look different from person to person, and some are impacted more than others, but we are all affected. During times of high stress and uncertainty, our psychological well-being will be impacted. Thus, we wanted to come together as units from the Division of Student Life to, sure, to be sure you, as UI students, know we are here for you. We all have mental health, and we encourage all of you to be intentionally caring for your mental health. I will use my time to share some overarching symptoms and signs of psychological distress, and then share some strategies for coping through COVID. So as we've alluded to a couple times already, everyone reacts differently to stressful situations. There's no doubt that right now is stressful. There are likely a range of emotions you're experiencing, such as anxiety, worry, sadness, loneliness, frustration, fear, hopelessness, or uncertainty. It will be important for you to know signs of mental health distress so that you can notice them in yourself and in others in your life. 
This might include behavioral symptoms, such as an increase or decrease in your energy level, maybe thoughts of suicide, an increase in your alcohol, tobacco, or drug use, irritability and outbursts of anger, having trouble relaxing or sleeping, crying more than usual, worrying excessively, wanting to be alone, having difficulty communicating or listening to others, or maybe even a lack of interest in things that do typically bring you joy. Other physical symptoms might be stomach aches or diarrhea, headaches, migraines, loss of appetite or increased appetite, sweating or chills, and maybe being uh, more easily startled. You might some, notice some emotional changes like increase in anger, guilt, anxiety, euphoria, sadness, or maybe even feeling numb. You also might be noticing some changes in your thinking, you know, especially as we're um, moving into learning in an online environment, really noticing having trouble remembering things with your memory, feeling confused, having trouble thinking clearly or concentrating, or maybe uh, having difficulty making decisions. So all these are the ways that we might be responding um, to some of the distress we're under right now. So as you're monitoring your, your mental health and the well-being of your loved ones, it will be really important for you to know how you can cope with your own stress. Because after all, it is going to be hard to care for others in your life if you are not doing well yourself. You can manage and alleviate your stress by taking time to care for yourself. So I wanna give you some suggestions on things you might try moving forward. Um, first, it's gonna be important that you educate yourself and stay informed. You're gonna to wanna to stay up to date on the news of the pandemic so that you can maintain your own health and safety, but also it's gonna be important to set limits on how much time you spend reading or watching news. And also be sure that you are referencing accurate resources. It's also gonna be important to keep yourself healthy. You can do this through eating balanced meals to give your body the fuel it needs, staying hydrated and drinking adequate amounts of water. Avoid or limit caffeine, alcohol, and other drugs. Get enough sleep and rest, and also move your body and get physically active. We also like to think about the ways of being in relationships, relationships with others is important. So connecting with others is an, an, an innate human need. So you might FaceTime or Zoom with friends or loved ones. Uh, consider joining social networking sites related to your professional interests or hobbies. Write a letter to someone you care about or make a phone call. You might talk about your experiences and feelings, or you might find it useful just to enjoy a conversation unrelated to the pandemic. Maybe just to remind yourself of the many important and positive things you have going on in your life. It also could be helpful to set um, a schedule. So during times of uncertainty and high stress, it is human tendency to focus on the things going wrong, but focus on the things in your life that you can control, such as connecting with others or engaging in positive health practices, maybe engaging in hobbies such as reading or a board game or video game or creating music and writing. Um, next, find ways to relax your body. Um, you know, under stress, your body's tense, um, and that takes an impact. Um, so be sure that maybe you're engaging in deep breathing, you're stretching, meditating, praying, um, maybe, you know, giving yourself a relaxing break after a really hard task. Uh, you might even consider writing a journal, a, gra a gratitude journal, where you note things every day that you uh, are feeling grateful for. Another way to improve your psychological well-being is by caring for your community. So, um, you know, helping others in need and performing small acts of kindness stimulate the pleasure area of our brains and can also be a great way to feel like you're taking action when feeling helpless or lacking control in a situation like a pandemic. And finally, being your own advocate and knowing when to ask for help is going to be key to maintaining your mental health. Um, so, you know, University Counseling Service, we are continuing to provide therapy services as well as psychoeducational programming for all enrolled students. You can visit our website at counseling.uiowa.edu to learn more about what services might benefit you at this time, or you also could just call 335-7294 to schedule an appointment. Two other resources that will be important for you to know about is the uh, Community Crisis Center here in Johnson County that you can call. They're available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The number for that is 1-855-325-4296. 
as well as the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Uh, the number there is 1-800-273-8255. And as we move through our panel discussion today, you'll learn more about additional resources available to you. So as I wrap up my time, I wanna leave you with an example of how I cope. So my family and I, we really enjoy laughing together by recalling funny moments um, and storytelling and telling jokes. Uh, so I wanted to share a joke that one of my kids uh, recently told me. So he asked, why don't cats play poker in the jungle? There's too many cheetahs. So that's what I'll leave you with today. Thank you. Outstanding. Thank you so much, Kelly. Thanks for that good giggle and thanks for getting us started. I will turn this over uh, to Noelle Mills from uh, undergraduate or University of Iowa student government. Thanks, Barry. Um, so I definitely want to acknowledge that I am not trained like the rest of these people and I don't have like anything that makes me especially qualified, but um, what I do know is um, specific examples of how students have been kind of like struggling during this time and then um, hopefully I can provide a little bit of insight into how I advise like my friends and my peers to handle those situations. Um, and I think it's also really important to to know that you're not alone. So it can seem like you're the only person who's struggling with virtual learning or is having family issues or having financial stress. But if, at least for me, like to know that other students are feeling this um, doesn't make it feel better, but at least you're not alone in that feeling of struggle. Um, so the first topic area is the stress of moving to virtual learning. Uh, it's obviously not anything that, that any of us signed up for. Um, and it can be difficult because a lot of times there's new and different and sometimes even more assignments to compensate for the lack of physical learning. And it can be difficult to keep track of deadlines and different types of rules. And there's rules coming in through your email and there's rules being posted on ICON and um, you don't even really know where to look. There's just so much coming at you. So that can be difficult to stay organized. Um, and also too, like it's, it's difficult because we're having to students who need accommodations uh, either you're having to get new or different accommodations and that can be difficult because some professors aren't super chill about getting new accommodations um, and that can be really disheartening and frustrating um, and then additionally with Wi-Fi issues I mean I live on a in, on a farm in the middle of nowhere and my Wi-Fi goes out all the time it might, might go out while I'm talking to you uh, and I know I've heard for my friends that some professors have been taking away participation points because your Wi-Fi goes out, which is obviously ridiculous. So if you're having issues with professors, if you're having issues with um, your Wi-Fi that's causing you to lose points, I really encourage you to reach out either to the professor, if the professor's not being responsive, contact the department head, contact the dean, like you're paying money for your education and you, you deserve to get the points that you deserve. So please don't stop reaching out until you get um, justice because it's, it's not fair for you to have to struggle during this time because of reasons that are out of your control. Um, there's also just general feelings of like, why am I writing a 15 page research paper when there's a global pandemic? And that's something that it, it's, it's difficult, right? Like it's hard to focus on these things when students are worried about their family members, you're worried about your friends, you're worried about um, how to pay rent. Um, wh where am I gonna work in the fall if you're graduating? The job market right now is less than ideal. Um, so it's just, I'm finding it just like kind of hard to, to concentrate and I think that's a common feeling. Um, speaking of stress, like these new environments can pose a lot of new challenges that we're not used to. If students are still in Iowa City, uh, any issues with roommates, which I know are really prominent, those can be amplified because you're there all the time. Um, but at the same time, like feelings of loneliness can also be amplified because you're either only with your roommate or maybe you're in an apartment all by yourself. So loneliness I know is a, is a really big issue. And even if you have moved back home, like I'm back home and there's five other people in this house and I still feel lonely sometimes um, just because we're not in Iowa City with our friends, with our normal life. And fortunately, I have a good relationship with my family, but I know that a lot of students don't. So for some students, it might be difficult to have to live with parents who maybe are super judgmental or to live with siblings who you don't get along with or whatever that may be. Um, but sometimes for students, you have to do it to save money or for whatever other reason. Um, something that I don't think gets talked about a lot is um, body image and eating disorder issues, I think can really be 
like inflamed or amplified during this time, especially if you move home. Um, there's different food, there's like maybe limited access or more access to food, um, having judgmental family or, you know, even just not being able to move or exercise in the way that we used to be able to do can make us feel different ways about our bodies. Um, and I know that that can be really difficult to navigate. Um, and then the final thing I'll say about environmental stress, and I would, I think is on a lot of our minds is um, what our, what our Asian American friends or just the Asian students in general may, might be feeling right now with feelings of xenophobia or straight up racism. Um, that I can, I'm not even going to pretend to imagine how stressful that might be, but it's something that we should all be aware of and do our part in trying to mitigate. And then the final type of stress that I want to cover is financial stress. I know that at least a lot of my friends have been losing their jobs at Yotopia or Spoko or wherever else in Iowa City. And a lot of students rely on that, even just to, to pay their rent, to pay their bills. A lot of students are living paycheck to paycheck. And a lot of us were left out of the federal stimulus package because if you're over 16 and you're listed as a dependent on your parents' taxes, you weren't eligible for that. Five, your, your parents weren't eligible for, for that $500 and you were not eligible for the $1,000 as independents were eligible. Um, so that's hard. And we're working to try to get that um, fixed. But for now, we, we were left out. And it's difficult because we still have to pay rent. Like it's really, it's nearly impossible to break out of leases, especially in Iowa City. Um, and we're getting a partial, a, a partial amount of our fees refunded, but obviously that's not enough. That's like maybe a couple hundred dollars. So I want everyone to be aware of the emergency support fund through the Office of the Union of Students. Student government usually funds it up to 5,000 every year, but this year we were able to secure almost $100,000 of our own funds to move over. And then um, like the, the happy thing, the, the thing that like gives me joy as we were instructed to share is that a lot of student organizations have actually been donating their unused student government allocations to the emergency support fund. And that has been tens of thousands of dollars in addition. So if you're struggling at all financially, even if you think, well, maybe I don't need it as much as someone else, you do need it as much as someone else and you're, you, you're entitled to it. So please, if you use Google emergency support fund to you, Iowa, you should be able to find it. And you can always email me if you are struggling to find it. So that's all I'll say, thank you. Very good. Thank you so much, Noelle, and your expert voice rang through um, in so many ways. So I so I so very much appreciate you being part of this panel, and thank you for everything you did this year as president of UISG. I'm going to turn this over to Linda Krohn from uh, Women's Resource and Action Center, RAC. Hello. Um, I'm glad to have the chance to talk today. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is what Barry alluded to at the top of the, of the town hall here, which is that this experience is not impacting us all in the same ways. And in particular, I'm gonna talk about some particular um, communities within our university community and how there may be some particular kinds of impact for those communities. And then I'm gonna share some kind of tailored words of encouragement for those communities as well. Um, so I'm gonna start with folks who are members of communities of color. Um, it is, as Noelle alluded to, there has been a dramatic rise in anti-Asian acts of hate and discrimination and even threats of violence that is producing um, some, some terrible impacts for folks who are of East Asian descent in particular, those who are perceived as being as East Asian, and it's, it's spilling over into other Asian identities as well. Um, the existing, already existing health disparities in this country for Native folks, for Black folks and Latinx communities have been magnified by, by COVID-19. The lack of access to healthcare, the lack of access to good nutrition, the disproportionate poverty, all these things are under the magnifying glass right now. In addition, anti-immigrant policies and rhetoric have left a lot of people feeling particularly vulnerable and unable to access needed healthcare and financial assistance. Also, the existing disproportional incarceration rates of people of color, particularly black and brown men, who are being held in prisons around our country are at enormous risk for outbreaks. And this is a matter of particular concern. And then finally, one of the particular impacts for folks of color is that unemployment is disproportionately impacting these communities as well, 
leaving people at risk for homelessness, food insecurity, and illness. Now, some words of encouragement. Communities and people of color in this country have a long and deep history of withstanding and surviving discrimination, displacement, and loss. This is a strength that can be drawn on and used to bolster determination and hope. And remember, your perseverance now will serve as a strength to those who come after you as well. Another possible asset you can draw from right now is that if you have left campus and returned home to family and your own community, you may now find yourself in an environment that is much more rich with folks who share your identities and your experiences. And that can provide you with needed camaraderie, understanding, and respite. These are all strengths that you can draw from as you cope with the topsy-turviness of life of life as we know it right now. Next, I wanna talk a little bit about impacts on folks who have disabilities. People with disabilities face heightened health risks in the face of this disease, both from the virus itself and from barriers that exist to access for needed healthcare and support services. Students with disabilities have already faced particular additional burdens in making the transition from in-person to online learning, including needs to, adapt it, to obtain adaptive technology and to access campus services remotely. The focus of our healthcare systems and their resources on addressing COVID may also mean delayed access to needed care for other health concerns that may be of particular impact for folks in the disabilities communities. And finally, the anxiety and stress that we're all dealing with right now may particularly exacerbate and complicate challenges for cognitive processing that can really interfere with daily functioning and with trying to accomplish academic work. So a word of encouragement I will give for folks with disabilities is to remind, you, remind yourself of the challenges you have already faced and overcome in your lifetime to get to where you are now. Draw on that. It will bolster your belief in your own ability to meet this challenge and provide hope for you when things get hard. And remember that your perseverance now will serve as a strength to those who come after you as well. Next, I'd like to talk a little bit about some challenges that may be facing folks who are immigrants to this country, whether documented or undocumented, as well as international students and scholars here at the university. We've all heard the quote unquote nativist and anti-immigrant sentiments in our various media. That coupled with the changing and troubling policies toward immigrants and international students and scholars can create a real climate of fear and isolation. In addition, in addition to that, concerns for family members and friends in other countries where the virus is also present may produce anxiety and feelings of helplessness to assist them. Then there's the anxiety of what might happen if you become ill, whether with COVID or something else, so far from home and in a place where the healthcare systems already may be overwhelmed. This can lead to feelings of fearfulness to interact with other people and to withdraw into isolation. All of these worries and concerns may make it exceedingly difficult to engage in academic work. So my word to you is to encourage you is to take a moment and reflect on all you have already accomplished <clears throat> and what an achievement it is to simply have made it to where you are right now. Draw on those thoughts, especially when things are hard, when you question or doubt yourself, when you wanna give up. And like I've said before, your perseverance now will serve as a strength and inspiration to those who come after you too. And then finally, I'd like to address some challenge that, is, that are facing folks in the LGBTQ plus communities, communities I consider myself part of. 
it may be for students who have left campus and returned to places where your identity is met with hostility or hate or even threats of violence, that you may be feeling a heightened sense of danger and vulnerability. And this may create a need to survive, to retreat into the closet. Rejection by family members and friends can be particularly difficult right now. Being away from your campus communities of friends, significant others, and kindred folk can produce feelings of isolation and despair. And anxiety about interacting with healthcare systems, should the need arise, may cause you to engage in hypervigilance in trying to avoid illness or reluctance to seek help when needed based on fear of how you may be treated. These sources of anxiety and stress may impact your eating and sleep, increasing the challenges you face in maintaining your health and your ability to function. I want to remind my queer kin folk that queer folks have endured and survived persecution, discrimination, violence, and hate for centuries. Recall the fierce drag queens and the butch lesbians who rioted at Stonewall, the courage of the Hijra in South Asia, and the spiritual leadership of two-spirited people native to this continent. Let this global community that spans time buoy you up in your hard moments and provide you with the strength and determination you need to persevere and succeed. And remember that your perseverance too will someday serve as a strength to those who come after you. For any members of, of communities of marginalized folks who are part of our larger University of Iowa community, I encourage us all to draw on the solidarity of friends, faculty members, and staff here at the university who form your circle of support. Reach out to support them as well. Reach out to others within and beyond your families of choice or birth and your community for support and affirmation. Know that you are valuable, beautiful, amazing, and fabulous, and that your well being matters at the University of Iowa and everywhere. And know that every day you also have the opportunity to make someone else's day better. Look for that opportunity and go for it. And then finally, because it would not be appropriate for me to avoid activism talk, even at this time, don't stop demanding from those of us with white privilege, action and accountability to dismantle racism. Don't stop demanding from those of us with ability privilege, action and accountability to dismantle ableism in all its forms. Don't stop demanding from those of us whose US citizenship status insulates us from particular challenges, action and accountability to dismantle xenophobia wherever it arises. And let's not stop demanding from those around us with heterosexual or cisgender privilege, action and accountability to dismantle heterosexism and cissexism, cissexism in all their forms. Together, we will get through this experience, and together, we can make a better world. If you need any particular support services at this time, I encourage you to call us here at RAC at 319-335-1486, and we will connect you directly with folks in the cultural houses, with the folks at Student, with the student Disability Services, and International Student Support. Thanks, and keep going. Great. Thank you so much, Linda. I really appreciate that. And thank you for your activism. Adam from RVAP. Good afternoon. And thanks to everybody presenting so far and, and ahead. Um, Linda, thank you for the, the charge at the end of that too. So I want to just quickly update all students here today uh, about RVAP's services. We continue to provide free confidential advocacy and support uh, just virtually uh, rather than in person at this time. So if you or anyone uh, in your life has been uh, either directly victimized or is experienced as a, as a support person to someone who's experienced sexual violence, know that RVAP is here. And you can access us in the same way by the telephone 24 hours a day. Uh, the, those two phone numbers, and I'll share them again, uh, is either 319 
335-6000 or 800-800-228-1625 if you want to call us toll free. Uh, you can speak with an advocate any time of day, 24 hours a day, um, and we can arrange to support you. Uh, we have uh, telehealth capabilities in all of the hospitals here in Johnson County and throughout our eight county service area in Southeast Iowa. Um, and we'll work creatively to find ways to support you uh, and those in your life as well as we can. So know that our services are still here. Um, the needs we know for those impacted by sexual violence are also heightened in times when they may be stuck at home when home isn't necessarily a safe place. So, um, so I'll step into some information about that too and resources, but just out of the bat, I want folks to know uh, that RVP, like everybody else on this call, is still here for you no matter where you are. Um, and my area of focus for the panel today is, is really to talk about trauma-informed care in ways that as family members and friends and colleagues, we can support one another from a trauma-informed lens. And when I say that, what I really mean is that we can look intentionally at another person and see their whole person, right? see their whole, uh, all of their identities, and take into account also any past trauma that they may have experienced, as well as any resulting co coping mechanisms uh, when attempting to understand that person, understand their behaviors, and then also to, be, to best be able to support them, uh, in, particularly in this time. So we all have big hearts and want uh, those in our lives to be happy and safe and, uh, and comfortable. Uh, and sometimes that instinct, which is right and which is good, can push us as a helper to try to fix or, or demand solutions or take power in a situation, a helping situation. And particularly for those who've experienced sexual violence, which is violence rooted in an imbalance of power. Um, while those attempts may be well-meaning, they just simply aren't as helpful and actually can re-traumatize re those who have survived sexual violence in the first place. So, so from a trauma-informed lens, the most important thing is taking care of ourselves. So understanding that you are, uh, absolutely deserving of support and balance and breath uh, as well. We can't give anything to anyone else that we don't have ourselves. So the most important part of taking care of someone in your life is making sure that you're taking care of yourself too. And so the feedback from others on the panel already um, just really supports that and, and has already provided a lot of resources about ways to do that. Um, and I think especially from a trauma-informed perspective, there's ways in which we are accustomed to helping as a society and as, as a community that we're restricted from doing. I talked just before about some restrictions physically that we have at RDAP. We can't physically be in an emergency room now to support a survivor, but we um, are finding ways to do that with telehealth instead. And so you may feel limited yourself in not being able to do the things or show up in a way that you are used to showing up to give support to those in your lives. So just understand that that additional stress um, allows you to, to need to take care of yourself in a, in, a, in a heightened way too. So be relentless with your love of yourself um, and, and that will also model uh, for the people in your lives uh, that same energy and hold space for them to do the same. Um, again, if we're doing the best that we can, then there's really no room for shame or grief or um, uh, all we can do anytime is the best that we can. So, um, so a couple strategies, if you're from a trauma-informed uh, lens to support those in your life, survivors or not really. Um, I'm gonna frame it in that way, but all of these strategies I think can be helpful for anyone in your life. Um, the first is to reach out to remember to reach out, um, especially when we're separated by geographical distance. Um, don't underestimate the power of your relationship. Uh, as human beings, we know that we need oxygen and water and food to live. We're also hardwired to connect. And so, especially in these times where we're socially and physically distant, um, make sure that you're reaching out to the people in your lives. That helps you and that offers uh, open doorways for them to seek support as they need it as well. As I indicated before, just remember that home isn't necessarily a safe place for everybody. So try to practice um, the trauma-informed approach and make sure that as you're reaching out, for, particularly for those that are living in, uh, in an environment where they're still being harmed or at risk of being harmed, that sometimes reaching out can create more danger for them. So be mindful of the ways that you do that. Um, 
In other words, if you're sending, if you're sending a text message or communicating versus via social media, understand that the person causing harm may have access to that information. And so just be very neutral in your reaching out, reach out still, but be neutral in the way that you do it. Um, and then allow the victim or survivor or the person in your life to be as vulnerable as they're willing and able to be. Uh, it can also be important to think about um, kind of some safety planning. So um, again, every situation of violence is different, um, but uh, you might be able to work out a code word with people in your lives. So if you're communicating, whether that's via text, uh, social media, or in video chat, like FaceTime or, or Zoom, as we are today, you can come up with code words together. One code word could mean, call me right now so I can get to another room. You could have another code word that means um, call the authorities. So finding ways that you can communicate and support one another in a way that doesn't create additional vulnerabilities or risk for, for the person in your life, I think is really important. Um, sharing resources is important. Again, so much of what is happening to all of us right now, the trauma that we're all experiencing is this kind of removal of agency and removal of control that we have. So finding ways to get information to people uh, resources to people is really important. So I've shared RVAP's 24-hour support line, um, also share RAIN is a, a national organization, the Rape, uh, Abuse, Incest National Network. They have a 24-hour support line and chat line available as well. Um, thinking about sending basic necessities to those in your lives, if you have the ability and privilege to do that. All of those things can be helpful and regain a sense of control and normalcy for folks. Um, and then I think, the last piece I'll, I'll just add here is, it's also an opportunity, so much of our communication as it is on this panel discussion is now connecting through devices. And so it's an opportunity for us to model digital consent with one another too. So just because um, someone's sharing a story with you or an image with you um, or a link with you, whatever, make sure that you're getting their consent before you share that out, right? Take the, take that we always talk about in front of presentations that we get, right? Take the lessons with you and share them everywhere you want, but the stories, make sure that you keep those safe. So it's another opportunity just to model consent uh, as we're communicating with devices and in ways that we're not necessarily accustomed to. Um, and again, be authentic and be willing to be authentic too for those that in your life that you know are struggling. Knowing that you're struggling too is reassuring more often than it's overwhelming. So it doesn't mean that you can't, um, you have to put on a particular mask or pretend to be a particular level of okay. You, some days are, are better than others, some moments are better than others, and it's important for those in your life to know that you're uh, on the ground experiencing those things just as well. Um, and to that, what I'll leave you with is my anchor and hope. I've got two little Yodas uh, that I get to live with every day, my two sons. Uh, four and six, and just an example, they, they root me and ground me. Um, I'm a stubborn learner, but they ground me in being as present as possible all the time. And yesterday, I was on a bike ride with them, and I'll try to share this. I don't know if it'll come across, but the story, I hope, resonates regardless. Um, we were on a bike ride, and my youngest son stopped because he was in awe of something that he saw on the sidewalk, so I was expecting a toy or something right, that I thought would have value. And what he saw was uh, just, a, I think it looks like a rust mark. I'm not sure if you can see that. It's just like a brown dash on the sidewalk. Um, and he stopped and he got off of his bike. That's him. Um, and he said, Dad, it looks like a meteor. And he found wonder in a mark on the sidewalk, right? I walked past it, I was ahead of him. So just remembering to just stay as present as we can, find beauty all around us, find beauty in the mirror, as Linda so articulately said. Um, and know that continuing to nurture ourselves, we will get through this time, will pass and we'll be beyond this pandemic. Um, and so just making sure that we're staying as present and nourished and connected as we can along the way. So thank you very much. Great, thanks so much, Adam. Um, real quick reminder to our uh, attendees that you can type questions into the chat. You will not be able to see anything in the chat because it is view viewable only by myself as moderator and the panel. Um, but if you'd like to post questions to the uh, panel, you can certainly put those questions into the chat and we will have a Q&A time at the end. I also remind our panelists that we are running long as we could anticipate. So just to stay mindful of time so we can leave Q&A time at the end for our attendees. With that said, um, Janice uh, from Student Health, if you'll take it away. 
Yeah. Hi, I am Janice Knott, one of the psychiatrists at Student Health. So at Student Health, we are still seeing students for medical and psychiatric care. Most of that care is being done virtually. And what I wanted to talk about today were some themes that I was seeing and reading about um, with students. And one thing I want to talk about is that we are, we are all suffering some ambiguous losses and we are suffering them all at once. And these are actually ongoing losses. So it's not like just one loss. It's just, this is ongoing. And that's creating grief, some sense of grief too. And it can be really helpful to name some of the losses that we're experiencing. So losses such as in-person social interactions, loss of educational spaces, I hear that a lot from my students, loss of leisure and recreational spaces. Um, there's also, and this was maybe a little earlier on, but I think it's still ongoing, a loss of sense of safety. So a sense of physical safety. Am I going to get sick or is someone in my family going to get sick? And now I think we're seeing a loss of financial safety for some folks, which has already been mentioned. Um, but when there's a loss of safety, there may also, on top of this grief reaction, be a stress reaction that shows up. And that can show up with irritability, distractibility, insomnia, and just general worry. So with the changes associated with the pandemic, we are experiencing, I think, collectively a grief reaction. There are stress reactions that are happening. And that's creating emotional destabilization for all of us. And and I don't think anyone has not been touched by that, or I'd be surprised. And now I want to talk about when grief and stress get layered on top of mental health conditions. So things like anxiety, depression, bipolar disorder, eating disorder, PTSD, um, you may, it just, it gets layered on top and you may end up with some impairing symptoms that make it difficult to function. And these may include just not, not enjoying life, sleep disruption, really low mood that doesn't go away, anxiety that's impairing and you can't get things done, uh, low energy can, it can't get out of bed, poor concentration to the extent that you're not getting your work done, appetite changes, or even thoughts of death or wanting to die can enter the picture. And if, if you have a personal, I wanna say, speak to folks that may have a personal history of depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, eating disorder, PTSD, or even a family history of mental health conditions that are finding it hard to function right now, I would invite you to consider making an appointment with us or one of our medical providers at Student Health because we can assess and help to tease out some of those grief and stress reactions from underlying mental health conditions. And then we can provide some collaborative decision-making regarding medication or therapy that may help um, with what you're going through. So don't hesitate to reach out to us. We're not here just to give medication. We're here to give guidance as well, and we're happy to do this. Um, like I said, appointments are virtual and done via Zoom video. And this can involve multiple appointments, but you would just call 319-335-8394 to talk to reception staff about an appointment with one of our medical professionals. And I wanna move to some tips that I found helpful, and this comes from a psychiatrist, Dr. Sue Varma, uh, the four M's of mental health to stay well. And one is mindfulness. So that's being present for yourself, your feelings, and your experiences. The second would be mastery. And that would be doing something that you're good at or thinking about an adversity that you've overcome in the, in the past. So being mindful, thinking about things you've mastered. Movement's going to be important. Walking, dancing, jogging, biking, yoga, 
things that get your body in motion. That's the third M, movement. And then the last M is meaningful engagement. And that's identifying activities and, and people that are important to you and engaging in those meaningful activities. So think about those four Ms, mindfulness, mastery, movement, and meaningful engagements as ways to take care of your mental health. And the last thing I was gonna talk about just briefly is kind of coping or one way. Mindfulness has played a large role in coping for me. When I take walks, I try to be very aware of what's going on, but it's also reminded me that in these uncertain times, the seasons and nature remain very certain. And that to me brought has brought some comfort. And that's all. Very good. Thank you so much, Janice. And um, certainly something that's standing out to me already is that each one of these offices and services on our campus, um, as well as our student government, continues to operate and offer all of this support um, and service that we all have offered, even if we're doing them virtually now. Okay, thank you. Questions are coming in, so thank you for that. And I will turn this over to Karen Graycheck from Student Wellness. Thanks, Barry. So right now during uncertain times, especially with what we're facing, there's a lot of fear and anxiety. And I'd like to talk to you all a little bit about substance use. I know for myself doing con consultations with students and talking with other staff members, we've noticed some themes. So for some students, their access has totally changed. So they're using less substances. So I wanna acknowledge that. However, adversely, there are also students that have more access and due to the uncertainty and the stress of our current pandemic are using more. Nationally, data has been shown in the US that alcohol sales has increased uh, as of at the end of March to over 55% and online sales of alcohol have increased to over 200%. So as a society, we know that this is a coping mechanism that people are using. Now, specifically for students, if you notice that you're using more substances, whether that's alcohol, marijuana, tobacco, or anything else, I want you to consider what is motivating your use. Is it boredom, sadness, frustration, anxiousness, looking for an escape, any of those feelings? It's really good to think about that. So if you're thinking about maybe making some changes, it's good to know that in terms of high risk drinking, four to five drinks in a sitting is considered high risk or binge drinking. If you're thinking again about actually thinking and taking a step back at what your substance use looks like, consider making a monitoring card. This is something that we do with our students that we have consultations with. Think about how often are you using, how are you feeling when you're using, what's the amount that you're using, to really have a true uh, depiction of what your use looks like. So I want you to recognize that this isn't easy to change your substance use. Uh, but I encourage you to maybe think about taking a step back and there's plenty of resources to be able to help you with that. So some helpful tips I'd like to share with you all is to stay connected with the social network. We're really privileged right now to have lots of different ways to stay connected with people, whether that's your friends and family or people from Iowa City. Also, think about creating some type of self-care routine. So if that's taking a walk outside and plenty of the other resources that have already been mentioned. And then lastly, resorting to campus resources. I want to plug again UCS, uh, University Counseling Service for Individual Therapies, specifically for substance use. Also Student Wellness, which you can find at studentwellness.uiowa.edu. We have consultations via Zoom or phone for a variety of different health topics, including alcohol and other drugs, where students can have a free substance use eval, tobacco cessation, and many others. Also, the University of Iowa Collegiate Recovery Program, we are doing our continued success, not excess meetings, and those are via Zoom on Thursdays at four. So if you're interested in that today at four, and you can find more information on our website, along with some national recovery resources, the SAFE Project has three different open support group meetings for students all across the nation. So students can join that and learn more. Thanks. Thank you so much, Karen, really appreciate that. And we will finish up with Nikki Hodes from Student Care and Assistance. Hi, thank you. Um, so what I mentioned before was um, we work with students whenever there's like crisis 
this or barriers that are coming up to your academic and your academic experience and just your overall student experience. And one that we're working a lot with students right now um, is just making sure that they have their basic needs met, right? So we know that financially folks are struggling, families are struggling. Um, we're all trying to figure out how we're gonna make it through this time together. And to be able to be successful academically and pay attention to classes, if we're worrying about where we're gonna get our food, am I gonna have shelter tonight and somewhere to stay, like that can really detract from that experience. So I'm gonna highlight a couple key programs that are going on, uh, but know that just like everyone has said, Student Care and Assistance is here, we're operating, we will meet with you, and we can talk more one-on-one -on -one about what might be some really good options or resources to consider. The first that Noelle mentioned and gave point to was our Dean of Students Emergency Fund. Um, and at the end of this, I'll include some links in the chat that you all will see so you can access it. Um, but it's, it's a micro grant, typically around $300 or $350 that we can award. Um, and hopefully it will help give a little bit of that financial flexibility um, to be able to try to find some assistance. Um, you can find that on our website. And like I said, I'll include we do it just to make sure that there's room in your aid package because if we gave you the money and there wasn't room they would take money away from you um, but financially it's been great and they can also try to explore other options that you might have available to you too uh, we also operate the hawkeye meal share program so that has operated for years now and has been a great partnership with um, university housing and dining and our student government um, to be able to do that and so if students are still in need and are still struggling to find um, food and uh, to have be food secure, you can still request meals. Um, we work with dining. It's a little bit of a different experience. You're gonna have to order your food ahead of time and you'll pick it up and go because we're really limited. This is a possibility. So again, I'll include the link to our website to be able to do that. Uh, the university has created a basic needs website too. So we're trying to collect resources to help you meet your basic needs. Uh, it's just basicneeds.uiowa.edu. It's a growing list. If you've got tips that you found that have been helpful, you can include them for us to include as well. Um, but you can search by topics like food or childcare to be able to try to help meet those needs. Um, another one that I've been really using a lot of is it's called 211 and it's through the United Way, but specifically you can search by your zip code, you can call, you can text them to find specific resources um, to address really any basic needs um, issue that you can really think of that's coming up for you. And it'll do it by your, um, by your location too. So we also know that some of our students may be returned back home and you're not in Iowa right now, but hopefully you're, you're joining us today. Um, you can look up 211 and put in your state that you're with and find the resources specific to your location too. So that's a really, really good one. Um, finally then, as student legal services. So I know one of the big questions I've heard a lot about students and concern is having to do with rent um, because you signed a lease and how am I still gonna be paying for these different pieces. Um, it's a little tricky how to navigate that, but Student Legal Services is a great resource. If you go to their website, they've got some good information from Iowa Legal Aid about your obligations um, in this uh, time of crisis and emergency pieces. So um, I would definitely plug and consider talking with Student Legal Services or even follow their Instagram. It's been really helpful for me to learn about rent right now too. Um, but ultimately, Student Care and Assistance, we're here for you. We can talk with you about all those different resources I just shared, um, but the big thing is, is to reach out. It is going to be so hard already to achieve academically and success, we know, and if you're really struggling with some of these basic needs, it's a deal with that. Um, so I would encourage that. Um, I will share my stress reliever that we talked about for coping is I, I have a seven-year-old and she drew a lovely picture because uh, spring is still coming and life is still happening around us and I think we can hopefully take joy in the predictability of spring at least and knowing that we will see plants grow and life happen. Thank you so much to everyone. My gratitude to all of you for sharing your expertise and your services and your personal stories of pictures and meteors on the street and cheetahs in the in the woods and everything else that you all shared. I'm so grateful for all of your personal touches as well. We have had some questions come in. Let me share those with you. Um, th these are all general for the general panel uh, rather than specific. So the first one is, what do you think the top three concerns for mental health are from a student perspective and how can faculty be, in particular be helpful? Whoever would like to take that. 
I can start just from my perspective. So, um, you know, I'm not from a diagnosable lens by any means, but really just a lot of unmanaged stress and worry that's going on. Um, I'm hearing from students who they themselves may be infected or they have family or loved ones that have been affected and impacted. Um, and then trying to just be able to communicate with faculty about what their needs are. Um, it's really important that we're all kind of understanding what flexibility needs to look like. Um, and so I think sometimes it's a really stressful time to know what that is. And um, it can be hard sometimes to know how to talk about these kind of concerns and put that forward. Um, and so you can always work with our office too. We can help advocate with you towards your faculty too. Most faculty, we're all on this boat together. And so we're all gonna hopefully be understanding, but in a time crunch or if they just didn't quite understand what you're seeking, we're happy to help kind of you navigate those waters. Thank you, Nikki. Anyone else on panel? Um, yeah, I was just going to add, you know, I, I think one thing that can be ha uh, helpful from a faculty perspective um, and staff as well is to acknowledge that like things can't just move on as normal, right, or normal. And so you know, I would just encourage, uh, you know, faculty and staff to uh, take a stance of being understanding, you know, checking in with students, um, you know, being flexible, you know, if they lose Zoom connection, like the nice example that Noelle gave earlier, right, that, um, you know, do, does it really need to count against them? Do all assignments need to be turned in or can we, can we, you know, pull back a little bit um, to give people time to be adjusting and dealing with all the losses and things that they're up against right now. Very good, thank you, Kelly. Yeah, I would add to just piggybacking on that is that just keeping in mind that we're all doing a lot of emotional work right now on top of kind of our jobs and for students, the job would be getting their schoolwork done. But the fact that we're doing all the emotional work make it makes it seem and feel like it takes so much more time to do everything. And I hear that a lot. It just takes more time. And I believe it is because that emotional work that we're doing with the loss and stress and things like that. Very Keep good. That in mind. Next question is, um, basically, my parents are just bugging me um, at this point. And I feel like I reverted back to the rules of high school. Um, any guidance, suggestions for me as a student to continue to navigate what might be a long-term stay with my parents once again? I guess I would just say, like, you're definitely not alone in that. I've been struggling with that a lot as well. The biggest things I've been doing, and I know my friends are doing, is finding a place that's, like, just your own. I don't have, like, my childhood bedroom anymore, but... As you can see, I'm in my basement where my parents don't ever go. So just finding a space, especially a workspace where you know can be relatively quiet and people won't usually be populating is really important. And then also I take time to just go outside and like just work out outside every day. And it's a place where people know like, don't talk to me, don't call me, like don't come out here. So just finding those spaces that are your own and also refusing to let them talk to you like you're a child anymore when it's uncalled for. Because I think sometimes parents can think that they, can control you or, or, you know, shame you for what you eat or what you do, but you need to stand up for yourself. And you need to be like, I'm an adult now. I can make my own decisions. And like, obviously I'm going to respect you because I'm living under your own roof, but this is not necessarily like a child parent thing. It's like, we're, we're both adults and we need to treat each other with respect. Right. Thank you. I would add in too, is just, it's going to be managing some expectations. So I specifically, I'm a first generation college student. And so what going to college meant was very different than what my family understood it to be and so now you're home and it may seem very luxurious that you're home now and you're just using a computer and you're not having to do a lot when in reality we know this is even far more challenging than the usual academic experience and so maybe having to sit down and really talk with your family about what does this mean academically what does your time look like when are those protective times that you need to put into place and that it's not just the, the eight hours in a class period or however long, but it's all the studying that you have to do and the work afterwards. Because um, we also know families are juggling multiple children at home. Um, we're trying to all pitch in and kind of take care of the household too. Um, and so we just really, one thing I would encourage is just some really honest conversation and expectation management. Thank you, Nikki. Okay, next question that came in. Uh, actually, this is a bit of a theme that has run across some questions and falls sort of the under uh, idea of it would be great to have answers. When is school, are we gonna be fully in school? Is football gonna happen? You know, what's gonna happen with summer classes? Um, and so a theme that is appearing perhaps is around the idea of how do we best tolerate what is ultimately ambiguous? And how do we best engage in 
the tolerance of ambiguity in our lives where there may not be answers or clear cuts for a while. Yeah, I, I have a few ideas about that. I mean, just, you know, first and foremost, sitting with uncertainty is a very, very hard thing to do. Um, and so I just want to validate that, right? Um, that's what this is about, is the uncertainty of all of this. Um, and so I guess two suggestions. Um, one, you know, being able to acknowledge that, you know, all of the emotions that you're experiencing and this drive to figure it out and problem solve it, it's because of how difficult this is. And so being able to acknowledge like this is hard, um, you know, nothing feels typical right now. And so everything is taking more energy and more thought. Um, and there's a lot of anxiety with that. Um, but the other thing that can be helpful is, you know, finding control where there can be, right? So um, setting a nice uh, schedule for yourself where you can anticipate maybe what your day is going to look like or who you're going to get to talk to or some of the tasks you're going to get to do. Um, and so those are, I guess, two of the things that I would suggest. Great. Thank you, Kelly. Anyone else around the tolerance of ambiguity or uncertainty, as Kelly named it? I'm sure it's something we're all struggling with ourselves. Yep, that this is certainly something we are all sharing in is how to best tolerate all of this. Okay, next question is uh, around loneliness. I simply find myself feeling lonely. Um, and a lot of you mentioned the idea of connecting up with each other online, um, Zoom meetings and house party and phone calls and all that. And yet it seems that folks are still experiencing loneliness um, and having trouble managing that, especially in, the, in sort of the larger context of ambiguity of how long will this go on? So that's our next question. What to do about loneliness even when all the virtual things are not meeting my needs? I'll, I'll offer one thing and I alluded to this in the comments that I made. Um, it is amazing how helpful it is to each of us to reach out to support someone else whether that's virtually or in person. Um, one of the things that's been going on at my house, we've been sewing masks, right? And while I don't get to see the recipient of it, I feel the connection and the sense that I'm being part of something that's bigger than just me right here stewing in my juices. So I think looking for those ways to feel as though you, you have some agency, you have some ability to make a difference and that that is connecting you to other people is, is something to consider. Great, thank you, Linda. Anything, anyone else on uh, managing loneliness? I think what I would just quickly add to is um, oftentimes there's a lot of stigma about asking for help um, and, and to share that somebody's feeling lonely is a really vulnerable thing to do. Um, so to remember that, and if there's any kind of internal blocks that I carry or that we carry, be mindful of those and know that you deserve help. You deserve connection. You're not alone in feeling lonely. And so any of that kind of hardwired stigma around, um, around that, it's something to pay attention to, be curious about, and also to know that it doesn't need to block you, um, that there are a lot of resources, professional as we're sharing here uh, on campus, but um, you know, connection with nature, connection with, um, with animals, connection with things that are bigger than us, as Linda's mentioning. Uh, I think are really important. Just know that it's okay. We deserve to be able to get that help. And it's, and it's also okay to be struggling. Great, thank you. Um, I will let folks know that we've opened up the chat. So everybody who is in attendance today will now be able to see the chat. Um, and what uh, our panelists have done is gone through and populated connections for services that they're either representing or services that they mentioned, um, as well as other uh, resources around campus. So if you wanna check out your chat now, there's a lot of, um, listing of resources and whatnot there as well. I'm gonna finish us up with one last question um, for folks. Um, we got, yep, one last question. Um, if you could advise me as a student with one message I should share with other students as a result of this panel today, what is it you would advise me as a student to communicate to other students? I would say like if I could tell every student one thing, it would be, like student government is gonna advocate for you, but you also need to advocate for yourself. So if a professor is treating you unfairly, if you're having mental health concerns, if you're having issues with finances, like 
take ownership. You deserve to get help and you deserve to have these resources that we have, that we've like created for you. So advocate for yourself. Thank you, Noah. I would say that we are all in this together and there's a whole group of us that, that are here for the students. Great. Thank you, Janice. Just reach out is would be mine. I think we, we don't know unless we know, right? Just reach out. We may not have a perfect solution to you because you know we're in the same boat in some ways, but we're gonna work to figure out option A and B and C, and we're gonna try to get creative as much as we can with you to support you. So just just to one, I'm gonna steal Barry's analogy, but just pull on the web. So if you start with Linda and she knows that Karen would actually be a really good resource. We're going to get you connected. So just start with anybody here, even. Great. Thank you. OK. All right. So my specific uh, gratitude to everyone on the panel. Thank you for taking the time and preparing. Um, I appreciate the expertise that you shared, as well as the personal uh, moments that you shared as well. Um, I also want to thank everybody who was in attendance today. Um, and I want to recognize that you clearly are a member of a community of care by taking the time not only to look out for yourself, if that's why you came, or to look out for others if that's why you came, or both of those things. But clearly a contribution to the community of care we wanted to create for everyone today. So thank you to the panelists, thank you to our attendees, and please stay in touch with all of our offices. We continue to put, um, post uh, opportunities through the end of this semester and as we make our way into the summer. Okay, thank you everyone. Have a good rest of the day, a good weekend, and take care of yourselves. Stay safe, stay well. Bye-bye. <laughs>